Hey, good morning, everybody. It's my pleasure to welcome Jean Holloway. And for those of you who were at her first presentation in March, I'll just uh, talk to you a little bit about her, her background. She's a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Ottawa in, in the Department of Geography, Environment and Geomatics. I've never heard of that. Her research interests are focused broadly around determining how climate change is impacting various elements of the cryosphere in the Canadian Arctic and Subarctic. She has de many degrees. And you know, when you get the name, when you get the word fellow after your name, it's a, it's a great accomplishment. So I'm gonna leave it at that and let you get started to talk about climate change and its impact and how we can mitigate things like that. Thanks, Jean. I, you can share screen whenever you're ready. Okay, great. Thank you, Harriet. Uh, hey, hi, everybody. I recognize, I think, most of the faces from last time. Um, so, but it's great to be back. And I'm coming live from North Bay now. So, yay. yay. <laughs> um, so, I'm going to share. Can everybody see my screen? Good. Yep. I'm just gonna get organized here for a sec. So, um, like Harriet mentioned, I'm here to talk about climate change. And so uh, we we decided to do sort of a little lecture series. Um, this is part number two. So last time, um, last month, we talked a little bit about what climate change is, what climate is, what climate change is, and um, what the impacts are. and uh, this time for part number two, we're going to talk about adaptation and mitigation and sort of what we can do, what we need to do about climate change. Um, so just to summarize uh, what we talked about last time for those who may not have been here. Um, basically, what what climate is, it's um, long term weather patterns. So it's sort of the aggregated or clumped together um, weather for a particular region, city, area. Um, we talked about the greenhouse effect, which is what the Earth's atmosphere acts like. So it keeps heat in, and that's what makes Earth sort of an inhabitable place um, compared to other planets. Um, so little aerosols, particles, or greenhouse gases, GHG is greenhouse gas, um, those create the greenhouse effect and they trap heat in the atmosphere. Um, but what happens is when we emit greenhouse gases, so like carbon dioxide, methane, um, it increases the concentration of greenhouse gases in the, in the atmosphere and then amplifies that effect so that it warms the earth. So we talked quite a bit about the fact that climate change is unequivocal um, and that these the rapid changes that we're seeing are anthropogenic, which means they're caused by humans. So there is consensus among scientists and there's not a debate going on, which is what um, some people, uh, some people, some industries would like, uh, I think people to think that there is, there's a debate going on among scientists, but there, there is not. So that's kind of a really quick summary of what we talked about last time. And then we we got into um, talking about what the impacts of climate change are. So we'll we'll touch on that a little bit more today because I didn't get through it all last time. And we're going to talk about um, some North Bay specific impacts today. Um, and then we're going to move on to, um, yeah, like what can we do? Uh, what How can we mitigate um, and, and how can we adapt, which are two separate things. And we'll we'll talk about them both. So this is like a crazy busy map, um, but I'm just going to use it as an example. And I just wanted to, to highlight that um, that these impacts are happening all over the world. Um, so this is a map from the uh, IPCC or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So it's like a big international um, yeah, collaboration to tackle climate change. Um, and it, this is sort of an outline of the observed impacts. Um, so does someone, can someone, Lindsay, how about you unmute and yell out a continent for me and we'll just look in detail at the continent. South America. 
All right, South America. So uh, you guys can see my mouse here. So the legend's at the bottom. So at the top here, there's a little symbol of a fish. So that means there's an impact on marine ecosystems. Um, and then this little bar here, there's two little bars. So uh, it talks about confidence. So the confidence is low. So that means there's like not a whole lot of scientific evidence at this point, but there's some. Um, and then say down here at the sort of the tip of like Patagonia area, tip of South America, the same symbol. So there's a there's a another fish, but there's high confidence or medium, I guess, so the street bars. So yeah, so you, this is like the way that you would use this map. So there's impacts on marine ecosystems. These little droplets are um, impacts on rivers, lakes, floods, and or drought. So that's happening sort of all over South America. There's a little picture of a fire, um, which is wildfire, not surprisingly. Um, and then there's also a picture of a forest. So that's terrestrial ecosystems. And then there's a picture of a little group of people. So that's um, impacts on human and managed systems. So livelihoods, health, and or economics. And then there's a picture of a little tractor, which is food production. So, so those are, yeah, so lots of different impacts happening in South America. And that's sort of one of the ways um, that we could use this map. Um, so yeah, it's sort of like a summary and outline of all of the impacts that are happening globally. And then what the IPCC does is they have then like chapters on each of the continents since so they go into great detail about all of these impacts. But yeah, I just wanted to, to use this sort of as a highlight that um, things are happening all over the world. Um, Jean, what were the boxes on each uh, continent? Is that like a, a summary then? Uh, like these ones here? Yeah. Um, it looks like those. So, okay, what does it say down here? Regional scale impacts. So that means that that's happening sort of all over the continent rather than just at the particular location. So for this, for South, Central and South America, it's uh, the snow is glacier impacts on glaciers, uh, snow, ice, and permafrost. So that that impact is happening all over the continent. Okay. Does that make thank sense? You. Yeah, thank you. That's pretty scary stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but this is a very, very interesting map. Yeah. Yeah. And it so one of the things, and we'll talk, we'll we're gonna end with today with a little bit more like hope because looking at yeah. all the impacts of climate change can get a little demoralizing and a little scary. Um, but sort of the tone of the lecture today is like there are there is a plan like at the sort of international and even national level and local level too. We we have a plan to adapt to climate change and to to sort of reduce these impacts if we can. So awesome. don't be don't be scared. <laughs> so um, let's talk a little bit about impacts in North Bay um, and so. This uh, this chart and some of the charts in the next uh, few slides came from, um, I found this online. It's called the Northern Ontario Climate Change Collaborative. Um, so again, like even locally, um, there are people who are working on this and coming up with a plan, looking at impacts of climate change. And, and so, you know, it's uh, it's not hopeless. Um, so they've got this, this Northern Ontario Climate Change Collaborative has some really cool resources um, and I just found, found them online. So. Uh, check that out if uh, you're interested. Um, so some some of the impacts uh, that have been observed and are expected in North Bay are increased precipitation and flooding, sort of relevant to what <laughs> we've seen a lot of precipitation this week. Um, although I haven't looked, I don't know if it's if it's out of the ordinary or not, but uh, Lindsay and I were walking the other day and uh, it sounded like it's the water is like abnormally high, it seems like. So so that's you know that's a that's a, an impact of increased precipitation, right? Um, so that can lead so because there's increased precipitation and flooding, that sort of has impacts on health effects. So that can lead to it says here illness, injury, and death due to drowning and accidents, um, unsafe housing, so flooding, um, and then infrastructure damage, so like road washouts and stormwater management overload. So those are some of sort of the like repercussions of sort of the broader impact. Um, another one is extreme temperatures. 
So that's like pretty common um, all over uh, the world, I would say, but you know, uh, not unusual to see in Canada. Um, so some of the health effects there could be heat stress and heat stroke, dehydration, uh, cardiovascular impacts, and respiratory impacts. So people with asthma um, are you know at higher risk. And then uh, another big one, and we talked about this last time, was uh, vector-borne disease. So as you know, as areas warm up, um, the range of you know ticks and other sort of uh, small insects um, carrying disease, uh, the, the range uh, for their habitat expands. So you know we're seeing more and more ticks in northern Ontario um, carrying Lyme disease. So the uh, the instance uh, the instances of Lyme disease are going up, and you know that that this is for. For Northern Ontario, but um, malaria is also becoming an issue, and and so um, and other parts of the world, you know, mosquitoes and mosquito-borne illnesses are be are becoming an issue. So, those are some examples. Um, a couple more. So there, there in North Bay, there might be issues with food security. Um, so, you know, food security is a, an issue globally, but. Um, if there's extreme weather and then infrastructure damage, that sort of that has impacts on the supply chain. Um, and then uh, since you know global food production is impacted, um, there's potentially an increase um, in food security issues. You know where we are because uh, because of sort of the global nature of the food supply chain. So you know we saw this is it wasn't totally related to climate change, but we saw in increase in food prices when uh, the war in Ukraine started, right? Um, so that's not related to climate change, but if you think of that as an example, um, if a particular region has a huge drought, um, that can affect food prices all over the world. Um, it also ha could have an impact on mental health. Um, so that's actually a really common field of study uh, nowadays, especially for indigenous communities who are so like intrinsically tied to the land um, for their, you know, way of life and culture. But, you know, I think a lot of us, especially I, I know your group in particular is really passionate about the outdoors, um, as, as am I. And so there can be, um, you know, emotional distress and mental health uh, repercussions that come along with, you know, changes and loss of traditional land and, and food and culture. And then uh, depression, anxiety, and PTSD um, that can happen after extreme events. If you think about, um, you know, if there's a major flood or, uh, uh, so I was living in Ottawa um, last summer when there was the big tornadoes um, and, you know, we had power outages and things like that. And um, I wasn't, you know, my, my mental health wasn't affected, but um, I know I, I had a friend who was out of power for a week and that was, you know, quite distressing for her. So like those kind of things. Um, and then the last one here is uh, water contamination. So if, if there is more flooding um, that can spread pollutants and stuff from waterways into, um, into other areas and uh, can lead to more waterborne disease. So um, the, the picture in the background here is, is Lake Nipissing. Um, and, you know, it's expected that um, you know, as there's more flooding and more precipitation, um, there can be sort of more algal blooms and more, you know, um, instances of, um, I'm totally blanking on the, uh, the name of the, the disease that comes from, you know, getting water in your mouth while you're swimming. Um, so yeah, but that comes from, you know, if the, if the water is warmer and there's more flooding, it like can, E. coli, that's the word. I was like, what is the name of that thing? Um, so yeah, there's there's uh, there's higher risk for things like that uh, as there's more flooding. So um, we may we may see that the you know there's more and more recommendations for not not to go swimming, uh, things like that. So it can change it can change sort of the way that we use we use um, the land and sort of change our activities. Um, and on that note, another big one. Um, so probably, pro I would say probably the biggest impact in North Bay will be on tourism, especially winter. Well, not just tourism, but like local activities as well, winter activities. Um, and especially in the winter, 
Um, so as the temperature in North Bay warms, you know, we talked about, you know, it's expected in Canada that it's going to warm, you know, in the next, you know, 50 or 60 years, you know, a, a degree at least. Um, if you think about the winter season and it warming up a degree, right, that shortens the winter season, which, you know, some people might like, but if you're really into snowmobiling or skiing or skating um, or ice fishing, uh, having a shorter winter season and sort of longer shoulder seasons, um, that's, yeah, that really has a big impact on your way of life, right? And and it can lead to more accidents. Um, so, you know, you can see this ice fishing hut falling through the ice there. Um, people who, you know, have spent decades um, out on the land doing things a certain way, they're not used to these rapid changes, right? So they, you know, they're used to go being able to go out in the end of March or what, whatever, I don't ice fish, but they're used to the ice being a certain way, right? And so it can lead to more accidents because the changes are so rapid. So, oh, we already did that one. So this is um, a little graphic showing who, who is sort of the most high risk, what individuals are um, the most high risk in North Bay. So. High risk, um, high risk comes from increased exposure. So if you think about like, let's say flooding, for instance, if you're more exposed to flooding, then you're higher risk, right? Like if I live away from the floodplain, I'm not, I'm not at high risk um, of that particular impact. So that's a geographic location. So again, yeah, if I live on a floodplain, um, people who work outdoors are also exposed to things like extreme heat stuff like that. Um, and then again, like lifestyle, right? So if, if I don't ice fish, I'm not really exposed to that particular risk. But, you know, if I like ice fishing, if I like swimming in Lake Nipissing, those kind of things. So depending on your lifestyle, you may be at higher risk. Um, people who are more sensitive um, are increased risk. So older adults, um, and infants and young children and people who have chronic illnesses, they're more sensitive to, again, things like increased temperature. Um, if, you know, if you happen to uh, get sick from a vector or waterborne illness of some kind, like people who are more sensitive um, are at higher risk. And yeah, I think that's also relevant to, to your group as well. Um, and then other people who are at high risk are those with uh, reduced uh, adaptive capacity. And we're going to talk a little bit later about adaptive capacity, but basically it's your ability to cope with changes. So um, people who are physically impaired, people who are lower income, and people who are housing insecure have less of this ability to cope with change. And we'll talk a lot more about that later. So that was the bad news. <laughs> um, and then now we'll talk about the good news. Like what can we do? And there are things we can do. We can adapt and we can reduce those greenhouse gas emissions. So, so there, there is good news. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about two types of change. So there's personal changes where you as an individual change your own behavior to reduce greenhouse gas emissions or adapt. And then there are systemic changes where like our systems or our environment or our government or our, you know, the international system changes to address the underlying causes of climate change. So we got personal, we got systemic. So I mentioned we're gonna talk about mitigation and adaptation. So this is a graphic that I showed last time. Um, we don't need to get into detail, but basically these are the projected increase in temperature. So the red line is if we don't do anything, if we just continue on as we are, no change, no, no mitigation, no nothing. And the blue line is, is if we, if we have like lots of change, we become really sustainable. We reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and so Basically the difference, so what happens, mitigation is if, if we don't do anything, 
this is what's going to happen. But if we do mitigate, which means reduce emissions, we'll come down to this blue line. So mitigation is sort of the, the difference between these two lines. Um, An adaptation um, is how we cope with the change. So if we, even if we do a lot, um, we're still going to see a slight increase in temperatures. So the sort of the black line, I guess, where are we? 2020 is sort of about here. So we're going to see temperatures go up a little bit. So we have to adapt because there, if even if we do everything we possibly can, it's still going to warm a little bit because we've sort of already set the ball rolling. So we have to be able to adapt a little bit. So that's sort of the difference between those two things. And I'll I'll go into more detail right now. <laughs> so mitigation is the actions that we take to reduce the sources of greenhouse gases. Um, so that's things like, you know, you can see this big smokestack here. Um, we talked uh, last time about like where these emissions come from. So um, like cars, um, you know, if we chop down, well, yeah. So if we chop down a forest that um, increases emissions, but one of the big things is we also need to enhance the sinks of greenhouse gases. And what a sink is, is something that absorbs, you know, CO2 or methane. So like trees, for example, they take in CO2. Um, the ocean also absorbs some CO2. Uh, and then there's, you know, there's other, other, other ways as well, but sort of like the big, the big one is uh, plants. So that's a sink. So we need to reduce the sources and enhance the sinks. Those are the those are the goals of mitigation. And this is one of the graphics that I showed last time about sort of like in this is for the U.S., but it's um, similar in other places. But where where these emissions are coming from by sector? So um, transportation is a big one. So again, like these are the sectors that we need to target if we want to reduce emissions and have the biggest impact, like these are the sectors. So it's transportation and electricity. Um, but the one thing I really wanted to highlight is that over 70% of all emissions produced, you know, in sort of the last couple decades um, came from a hundred fossil fuel companies. Right. So like, like no matter what we do as individuals or um, as, you know, even sort of nationally, like if these if these companies and this industry doesn't get on board, it doesn't really mean a lot because they're producing a, a huge amount of the emissions. Um, so. Again, like not to not to. Um, not to be scary or anything, but like, it's just like, we need, we need everybody to get on board. Can I just say, I just, yep. when I see that slide, that's really significant. Mm -hmm. But you know what, I, I bring it from global to local, I'm thinking, do we really need two cars? Yeah. You know what yeah, I mean? Actually, like, we'll talk, the next, uh, the next two slides are all about like what we can do as individuals. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because that's the, and so that's the type of, that's the type of like conversations we all need to be having. Like, do, do I need two cars? Do I need to, um, do I need to sort of fly across the world to go on vacation? Um, those kind of things. But then, so I, I wanted to point out here too, that like, it's like what we do as individuals, um, even if all of us, like, you know, all of us in the room here, but all of us in Canada as individuals, even if we made radical changes, it still like doesn't, it won't, it won't be enough, right? Because because the, the corporations um, need to get on board. You know, because if even if we all change our lifestyle completely, we're only accounting for, you know, like less than 30% of the emissions. So like we don't have a huge impact, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't, make changes and so that's what we'll talk about next okay um so yeah so what can what can we do what can we do as individuals um and so there's a few things um 
basically, uh, I'm going to outline sort of like five key areas. Um, so the first being transportation and Harriet, you just mentioned that so that's a perfect example, right? Like, um, do we need two cars? Um, I think that the, the most important thing is air travel. So planes emit a ton of emissions, like more than anything. So, um, like, so, you know, one thing that I think about is like reducing the number of like international trips that I take. Um, so a personal choice you can make is like, instead of, instead of going, um, somewhere overseas for vacation, like, can we go somewhere locally or can we go somewhere, you know, that's like in Canada or like a sort of a shorter flight. Um, so just reducing air travel, that's the biggest one. Um, and then increasing sort of the sustainable ways that we transport uh, or we travel, like walking, running, cycling, those, those emit zero emissions, right? So like those things are great. Um, and then sort of then comes public transit. Um, so I, you know, I'm not, I haven't been in North Bay very long, but like I know in Ottawa, at least like I, I took public transit as much as I could because that um, there are still some emissions with public transit, uh, but it's less because there's a whole bunch of people on one in one vehicle. Um, and then sort of the next thing, the next sort of best thing is uh, where possible getting an electric car or a hybrid. Um, again, not totally not feasible for everyone. And also, again, there's some emissions that come with with that. So the goal is to get getting to zero emissions, right? So so even with electric cars, there's still there's still some. So they're not perfect, but it's better. Um, the next the next really important thing as uh, what we can do is is uh, our diet and what we eat. So the biggest thing is uh, like meat meat production, especially beef, um, is very high emissions. So eating less meat, especially beef and and other red meats like lamb and things like that, that's like sort of the number one thing. Um, and then and dairy also. So anything anything um, sort of you know that comes from a cow. <laughs> so cows um, cows uh, they. Pay, they sort of take a lot of um, emissions. So like they eat a lot of the grass and things like that. So those are sinks of emissions. Um, and then they also, we talked about this last time, they um, increase the amount of methane in the atmosphere just from their, just from them living. Um, so eating less meat is number one. And then also things like buying local, right? So we talked uh, earlier about the sort of global food production system. So when you think about like, like if I get a cucumber that has to be transported all the way from um, South America, um, that's the really high emissions, right? So, um, and again, like we're in we're in Canada, so like we can't buy local all year round. It's not really feasible. Um, not well, not for me at least. I think some people are really good about that, but um, it's sort of just like trying to do our best. And then another really big one is um, overall just like less consumption, right? We we as a society, I think um, use a lot. We just use a lot. And so um, one of the things I wanted to highlight is that is we we hear about recycling a lot, but actually recycling is the third thing. So it's first it's reduce, then it's reuse, then it's recycle. Um, because you know if we're if recycling isn't um is still really consumption based right we just use and use and use and then we recycle things but if we reduce and reuse first that actually reduces and limits emissions and pollution and garbage so it's all it's all good um some other options are like buying secondhand clothing or you know i i'm really bad at this but um you can mend clothes or repair garments and things like that instead of just throwing things out and buying new things um or buying green green or eco-friendly products um that they tend to be a little bit more expensive but um sort of that's sort of how we we can um sort of show up in that way um i know sort of the fast we could have a whole lecture on this but the fast fashion industry is really really high emissions um and and you know this isn't related to climate change, but like it also produces a ton of garbage and a lot of the garbage gets sort of shipped to developing countries. So um, the fast fashion industry, so like things like H&M or, you know, 
uh, uh, Forever 21, all these little, these, the, the clothing that's like cheap, um, it's, it's very, you know, bad for the environment. Um, and then the last thing, so, I mean, we've all heard about single use plastics, right? So that's like straws and garbage bags, uh, things like that. Um, so, you know, I, <laughs> I, uh, I don't like it so much because, you know, we, we hear this all the time in the media where like, Tim Hortons is like, look, I, we don't use plastic straws anymore. And they sort of, that's their way of getting around. Like, so it's, it's a term called greenwashing and they try yeah. and fool us into thinking that they're doing good things for the environment, but really like, are they? Um, however, eliminating plastics is, is a good thing. So, you know, for us as individuals, it's, it's um, thinking about things like you know, I use Tupperware um, instead of Ziploc bags, stuff like that. Or, and I, you know, do my best to not use uh, plastic bags. I bring my reusable grocery bags, just like little choices like that. They do make a difference. I have metal straws that I, I try and use. Um, and like nowadays, like most places have those paper straws, which is, is good. Although I hate the paper straws. They just dissolve <laughs> in my drinks. I hate them. <laughs> Hopefully we can find a better thing than paper. And then another another big one um, is is you know what we can do at home. So things like getting energy efficient appliances, um, and and this doesn't mean like get rid of everything you have and get energy efficient, right? Because that's that's um, that's not reducing and reusing. So like using the using the, the stuff that you have right now until you need to replace it, and then thinking about replacing it with something energy efficient. Um, and then a, a really big ones is improving um, heating and cooling efficiency. So like insulation, um, because yeah, if we're if we're if we have you know our AC or our heat pumping through the house, but it's not um, staying in the house or it's not yeah being efficient, it's yeah it it's wasteful. And then depending on what kind of electricity or furnace or whatever we have um, can be really high emissions. Um, other things we can do at home is so like thinking about um, green energy. So like getting rooftop solar panels uh, is a really good example. Again, not feasible for everybody. Um, there's a there's a pretty big um, upfront cost with solar panels, although there are some good subsidies nowadays, I think. Um, but uh, again, that's a, that's a, something to think about. And then other big ones like um, planting new trees in your yard or um, having sort of native plants um, like as your lawn or um, just gardens and things like that. Like those are sinks of, those are sinks of emissions. So yeah, um, I, you know, I'm looking out the window and we're surrounded in North Bay, we're surrounded by nature. So not too, not too hard um, here, but in other sort of bigger cities, it is, that's, uh, that's more of a big deal. And then other little simple things like washing washing your laundry with cold water, um, less emissions because you know to heat the water um, again like uses that electricity and depending on where your electricity is coming from, um, and then like yeah hanging hanging laundry to dry instead of using the dryer. So like or yeah like running the dishwasher less. Like there's there's all sorts of little changes that we can make. And then probably the biggest thing that we can do is get involved. Um, so like I said before, right? Like we need everybody, industries, governments, everybody to get on board with this. And so like political advocacy is like the number one thing us as individuals can do. So like, like when you go to, when you go to vote, like this, this being um, of concern, making sure that your, your candidates are talking about what what how they're going to tackle climate change what is what is what are they going to do for your your local area or nationally um, and then the other big thing is like talking to your loved ones right like having these conversations about climate change just making sure everyone sort of understands or um is thinking about it or is prepared right and i know it's hard um you know i have some loved ones who 
who my grandpa in particular, um, he, he's from out West and, you know, we, our family sort of heavily invested in the oil industry. So him and I have had some tough conversations, but he's, you know, I go into it with an open, an open mind and just patience. And, and, you know, he, he listens to me and he, he trusts me as somebody who, you know, is an expert in this area. So we've, we've made some really good progress over the years. Um, so yeah, this this is really the the number one thing that we can do is is have these conversations. I mean, you guys invited me here to speak, so like, and you guys are already already doing this. You're already taking action. So, kudos. So I wanted to highlight this again. Um, I'm just going to read this out. Focusing on how individuals can stop climate change is very convenient for corporations. So they want us to think that it's our fault, right? Um, so like, I want you guys to, to take this away today is like, there, there isn't a whole lot we can do as individuals, like changing, you know, washing our clothes on cold water isn't going to solve climate change, right? Um, we, we need to hold industries and governments accountable. And so that's why political advocacy and getting involved is the number one thing that you can do. Um, we need we need everybody to get on board. And the picture on the right side, this is like my favorite thing ever. Um, this happened a few years ago. So um, BP is like a big oil company, as as you know, and they they put out this this um this carbon footprint calculator for people to to figure out how big their carbon footprint is and figure out how you can reduce emissions. And like this is ridiculous. They're like one of they're one of those hundred fossil fuel companies, right? That are, they have the big emissions. Like why, why are they talking to us about reducing our emissions? And like this happened right after the big accident where BP dumped like millions of gallons of oil into the Gulf of Mexico, right? Like, so like this, this is an example of what I was saying before, like greenwashing, right? So they want us to think that they're, you know, they're being environmentally friendly and that you know, they even look at their logo, right? Their logos, their logo is green. It looks like a flower. It's like, so it's, it's greenwashing. They're trying to fool us into thinking that, that they're, they're sort of friendlier than they are. So don't fall for it. And that's the thing, like, it's not our fault, right? It's not, because I always, you know, I can, I can get really bogged down in this stuff and think that, oh, I'm not doing enough. Like, I'm not, you know, I still drive my car. I still, and, and it's not our fault. So I just want you guys to take that away today. How are we doing for time? Do we want to stop and take a little break for questions? We're, we're at 940. Um, there's a couple of, there's a question in the chat or there was. Sure. Let's take a couple, a couple minutes for questions. And then I've, I've got a few more, uh, a few more slides so we can keep going. Okay. The, the pie chart you showed us indicated electricity use was a big impact to climate change. How does moving to electric cars cars help this? Mm, that's a great question. And so um that's a that's a perfect example of of why this is so complicated, right? Yeah. Um so it totally depends on how electricity is generated in a particular area. So um for example, like electricity can come from like solar power or wind, um, which are green so if if you're plugging your electric car in to a grid that's powered by sort of more green energy that's great but if you're plugging your electric car into a, a diesel generator right that's that's super emissions heavy so um it it depends is the answer <laughs> um so you know as a society moving towards green energy is is the way to go so more wind more solar more hydro um some people don't consider that totally green but um depends on depends on it's better than diesel and it's better than burning coal um yeah so that's that's sort of the short answer to that and that's why electric cars right they're not the the best option the best option is um like zero emissions so, you know, biking or walking or running or whatever, not, not feasible for everything, but. Dorothy, Dorothy I, a question? Go ahead, Dorothy. Yes, I, I wondered if um, 
I hope this isn't off topic, but if you've heard of the, the um, CO2 capture <clears throat> plant in Iceland, and, and if that's a good thing, or people are going to think, oh, well, like it's, it was so fascinating. I saw it in 60 minutes, and I couldn't believe there was such a thing in the world. <clears throat> I haven't heard about that. So, um, so I, I, if, if I'm understanding correctly, it's like one of those, the capture and storage yeah. plants. Yeah. Yeah. So that is, um, I, I, so I don't know a ton about that particular topic, but um, that is, and I think it comes up on one of the, yeah, it's actually on the slide, the next slide. <laughs> so oh, that okay. is, that is a great thing. Um, so that's one of the, one of the ways that we can um, reduce and emissions and mitigate is having more of these. And the, the oil company has said they're building their own, but uh, people aren't trusting that one. <laughs> yeah. I don't blame them, but I mean, that's, that's, um, that's a really good example. So like if, if oil companies all did that, they could get to net zero emissions, right? Cause they, they produce some emissions, but then they capture some. So that's, that's a good thing. Okay. Thanks. Thanks You're welcome. You. Neat. I'll have to have a look at that, Dorothy. Um, I hadn't heard of the one in Iceland. So thank you for sharing that. Great question. Uh, Go ahead, Bonnie. There's been a huge debate around uh, electric cars, just in terms of the batteries, the mining of the minerals for them, uh, and the, uh, you know, they have batteries don't last that long and what's happening to them. So is that, is that, you know, I, I don't know which way to go, but you, I'm hearing a lot about that. And yet they're supposed to still be better. I'm not sure. Yeah. Again, super complicated, right? So Mm -hmm. So like today we're just kind of talking about climate change, but then like there is, there's totally other aspects of this, like waste that sort of other environmental impacts that I'm not touching on. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, like how we dispose of batteries and other like hazardous materials is, is something to think about. Um, so you're totally right. The, um, from what I hear, the mining of, they're called rare earth elements that go into yeah. those those batteries and they go into our phones and our computers and our iPads and stuff like that as well. Any, any rechargeable battery. Um, typically they're mined, like a lot of the mines are in developing countries and the conditions, uh, so the people in those countries are being exploited, not always, but sometimes. And, um, just so that we can have our, you know, our phones and our, our electric cars and stuff like that. So it's like, there's sort of an ethical debate and then there's a debate about, about waste and stuff like that. So yeah, um, I haven't spent a ton of time thinking about it myself because I, I'm not like in the financial position to buy an electric car at the moment. Um, but you know, it's, it's one of those things to, it's just, yeah, it's sort of like, um, looking at the pros and cons, right. Um, I yeah. think in general, and this is, again, this is why we need we need our governments to lead the charge here. Like we can't, we can't make decisions like this. Um, like I, like I don't know what to do about you know mining in different countries. So we need our governments to to hold sort of these corporations accountable for the conditions that they mine these things in. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We need to regulate and we need policy in place to like make sure that these practices are happening in a way that's ethical, so that we can then make the right choice for ourselves and to help the climate and the environment. A good example would be the ring of fire. And I understand that that, that kind of mine, the mining that they're going to be doing there is open pit mining. And if you uh, just Google open pit mining and you'll get an idea what that looks like. They're supposed to restore the environment after, but I don't, I don't think it, you know, you think about the oil sands, I mean, they were supposed to restore the environment and, you know, people, the rivers are polluted, et cetera. So I can understand why the indigenous population is hesitant to, to sign on to this agreement. Yeah. But we'll see what, what that's going to look like. Yeah. Amazing. I see. Uh, Another question? Yeah, in the chat. So. Pauline asked, how are the launching of spaceships and satellites into outer space affecting our climate change? Yeah, good question. That is a super good question. And actually, I, so I don't know, I mean, 
it would you can see it if you've watched one of those launches right like the sort of the amount of energy it takes to shoot the rockets into space so um i would say it's it's not great <laughs> um but you know <laughs> space you know space travel and things like that that's like a whole a whole industry so um it would fall it would fall within sort of that one piece of the pie that we looked at earlier um so again like it comes down to like like i don't think sending uh spaceships and satellites into space like frivolously is a good idea we need some like you know the reason that we have a lot of the technology we have today is from like satellite technology. So like we need some, um, but like frivolous space travel or like, like, you know, we may in the future get into like space tourism and stuff like that. Like it's, it's, it's something to think about, right? Like, do we need to be doing that? I don't know. Um, but yeah, so it, it does affect climate change because, um, when they, when they launch, um, like they burn a ton of fossil fuels. So again, like if if they if they were able to move into some form of green energy, that would be better. Um, but yeah, so it, it impacts uh, climate change just the way the same way that burning any fossil fuels does. Good question. I don't know a whole lot about that industry. Harriet, you're on mute. There's a photo of Earth. If you Earth, if you uh, uh, Google Earth and satellites around it, you there's a photo of Earth with the the number of satellites that are are around the Earth, out in just in, within our atmosphere, and it's just pretty shocking. And yeah. I know that NORAD is very concerned about it, and there are there are groups trying to find ways to. You know, get them out of there. There's dead dead satellites there, and it's so it's so polluted with satellites that it's pretty hard to determine how they find a way through all of that to get get into outer space. But they yeah. they're very they're concerned about that too. But you you can do that. I'll see if I can find a picture later and and show it to you. Cool. All I right. Well, let's keep going. Oh, sorry. Did someone I'll else. Just We've often said, oh, we're so good in North Bay. We're kind of in a perfect location. We're not getting the craziness from the South, uh, the craziness from the West, you know, being close to water, we're kind of isolated. Is that a false comfort for us? In terms of impacts of climate change? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, hard to say. I, I think, I think it's not false. Like, I think some some areas of Canada, and I would say probably North Bay, um, won't be hit as hard, um, especially because since we're, I'm going to say we, because I live here now, um, since we're in the north, um, you know, if it, if it warms up a little bit, it's not going to be as warm. Like, so places like, you know, BC, where, um, you know, it gets, you know, we saw that like heat dome last year, right, where it got super hot, and then um, they have all these forest fires and all this sort of craziness going on. Um, they've also got to deal with sea level rise. Like they, so they're going to get hit pretty hard. Um, yeah. I, I mean, compared to other places, I, I think North Bay will be, will be like, okay. There still are some impacts like we talked about, but, but it doesn't seem like it will be as, as, um, as crazy to deal with. And we are, you know, one of the things like in Canada, um, there will be some benefits as well, right? Like we'll have a longer growing season, so we'll be able to produce more food. Um, so there are, you know, there are certain, and in some parts of Canada, it may be more pleasant and like the winters will be a little warmer and things like that. So um, no, I think, Bonnie, I think you are, uh, you're not totally off base there. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit more and I'm gonna skip ahead. There we go. I'm gonna skip ahead. Um, I gave some, I gave some, like the next few slides are examples of sort of like what we can do as a society. So um, 
there's stuff that the like, industries can do. So like technology change, um, recycling, and then uh, what Dorothy was talking about, carbon capture and storage. And we won't get into details, but those are some industry changes to reduce emissions. Um, we can make changes in infrastructure. So we talked about energy efficiency um, and then green energy, green power. I'm going to go through these really fast. So just like, don't worry about it. <laughs> we can talk more about it some other time. But um, another really, really good thing to do is we talked about carbon sinks, right? So like managing the ecosystem. So like planting more trees or making sure that nature is preserved and like, especially in like the rainforest, right? So like preserving those big carbon sinks. And then uh, we're going to fly through this and not talk about it too much, but like there's economic incentives. Um, so basically this is, and we've all heard about these, but like price-based instruments or tools that we can use to, um, so basically to uh, charge the producers um, or consumers um, to get like a desired outcome. So it's things like carbon tax. We've all heard about that. So that's um, some a tool that we can use to um, that so companies or countries or whatever um, they pay a fee when they emit CO two. Um, so basically, it's an it's an incentive to reduce emissions. So there's carbon tax, um, and then there's other things like um, ca like carbon cap and trade emissions trading. We, like these are things I'm sure you've heard about in the news. Um, and I don't know, I'm not a, I'm not an economist, so I don't know a whole lot about that. But again, it's basically just incentives to get these corporations on board with reducing emissions. Um, and then we'll talk a little quickly about adaptation. So we talked, this was all about mitigation. And basically adaptation is then like what the actions that we take to manage the risks from climate change or, or cope with the risks and cope with the changes what can how do we respond let's see here um we talked a little bit already about adaptive capacity so i won't go too much more into this but um basically there's like so there's these six key things that like help determine how we can cope um so economic resources like you know how much money we have basically so like if i if i live on a flood plain do I have, you know, the money to just to move, right? Some people don't. Um, some people do. Um, technology, information, like, do, am I informed about climate change? Do I understand the risks? Do I understand how I can adapt? Um, and then, like, what infrastructure and institutions are available to an individual or to a region? So these all help determine how we can cope. And then sort of the key thing here is developing countries have lower adaptive capacity. So they, you know, they are more sensitive, they are higher risk, um, and they, you know, they don't have the resources, so financial or institutional or infrastructural to cope. So developing countries and then also like high risk, we talked about high risk communities in, in our area too, right? So a lot of indigenous communities um, remote communities um, and, you know, and, you know, high risk individuals. So they have less adaptive capacity. I'm going to skip this, but I can send this to you guys. This is, this is an example. It's from up north on climate change. So this is all about Northern Ontario um, communities and how they adapt. So I won't go into this. It's a little busy, but I'll send it to Harriet. It's a whole, like, it's a whole little like magazine that you can flip through. Um, outlining like so here's like what the impact is this is all about flooding and then like these are all ways that um you can adapt um i'm just gonna i'm gonna stop sharing and i'm just gonna talk for a couple minutes um because sort of the last little the last bit i wanted to talk about was just like there is you know, a lot, most Canadians, like a lot of Canadians um, want, they believe in climate change, they believe it's important, um, they want people to get on board. Mm -hmm. um, and the problem is, like, 
it's called, you know, collective actions. Like we need, we need sort of these, like, we need big changes from industries, from companies, from other countries, um, especially the big emitters like the U S um, we need, we need collective action as, as a, as a global community. Um, but it's mm -hmm. really hard to get, to get people who are benefiting from emissions, right? So the, these companies that are making huge profits and these countries like the U S and China that are also like benefiting economically from emitting. So it's, it's hard. And so that's why, you know, we need these kind of sort of incentives, um, so yeah, it's a it's a collective action problem. And that's one of you know the reasons that can be a bit scary is like in Canada, there's like not a whole lot we can do if China and the US don't get on board and reduce emissions, right? So um, and I'll just end, I'll end actually, and I'll show you guys the slide that I made. Um so this is there is stuff happening though. So this is the Paris Agreement. So um, there are these international bodies that are like dealing with this, right? So this is the Paris Agreement was an international treaty on climate change. Um, you may have heard of it. It was it's like been in the news a whole lot. Um, so it's um, the UN has these climate change conference conferences, um, and this one happened in 2015, and you know, 196 countries signed this agreement. Um, and basically, the goal is to reduce emissions, um, to keep warming at 1.5 or two degrees above above pre-industrial levels. So, like, just keep it keep it as low as we can. Basically, mitigate. And so that's that's what we've agreed to. And so. Um, it's making these you know, these radical changes uh, to reduce emissions, um, and Canada has a plan. You know, we 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 have a plan to be net zero emissions by 2050. So this is in the works, even in Canada and internationally, right? Um, so there are people much smarter than me who are handling this, um, and it is it is happening. I would say. Um, I, I would say in Canada, we're not on track right now to meet our emissions targets. Um, we have we have targets for 2030 and we have targets for 2050. And yeah, I would say we're not on track. And this is this is where political advocacy advocacy comes in. Right. So we need to hold our policymakers accountable and we need to like be having these conversations. But. There is there is good stuff happening. Um. And then I'll summarize. I have two minutes. <laughs> so we need to mitigate to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. We need to adapt. So adaptation is where we take action to reduce the negative effects of climate change. Scientists, policymakers, you know, these people at the UN, they're we have options, we, know, we have a plan, and it's well known for the most part, and the missing ingredient is the action. We need people to buy in. We need, we need sort of this collective action. That's the missing ingredient. And there is still time to meet our targets and be net zero by 2050. So that's, you know, that's what we're aiming for. And then that's it. Wow. Yeah. That's outstanding, Jean. And that's exactly what we're looking for for the Community Resilience Fair. It's amazing. Wow. I, I'm very impressed. Uh, I don't think we have any time for more questions, but maybe we can pick it up in June when you come on. Absolutely. Okay. And if you have it, and um, I, I did some, I hope you're okay. I took some screenshots oh, of yeah. a couple of slides, if you don't mind. And uh, um, I that was so comprehensive. Anybody else want to comment? Really, really well laid out. I was just uh, now I know why you're a fellow. <laughs> that is very, very, very. Well, impressive. I tried to cram it. You guys now 
um, know as much as our undergrads um, who are like studying climate change know. So wow. just so you know, you're oh. you're now experts. At our at our uh, resilience fair, we're going to have a fellow from he's his name is Omid Karazmi from Iran. He's a PhD in planning, and he's going to be doing. When people come through the door, they're going to be able to do their ecological footprint. Oh, nice. And then all that you've showed us now almost lays out what we want the fair to look like. So I, I'll yeah. chat with you a little bit more about that. That's uh, just an excellent presentation. I learned I'll a lot. You, I'll send you the slides again, Harriet, so that you okay. can. Uh, that would be, that'd be great. Okay. And I, I think uh, you gave us, I think you did give us a lot of hope. I, I think there's lots of things we can do. Uh -huh. And one of them, you know, one, they may be little things, but you got to start somewhere. It's a collective one that can make a difference. And policy wise, it's a system change is needed. When I go to independent grocers, for example, I started asking when I buy fish, I ask for no plastic. I want butcher paper. And they actually go over and get the butcher paper and, and do that for me. And they're very accommodating. And I thought, what if everybody did that? Then they're going to make a change. They're going to make a change. Well, and so that's that's it. And I forgot to mention that specifically. But like, even if the little actions we take don't don't have a huge impact in terms of emissions, it's it it makes change from the bottom up, right? Like so us yeah. making changes forces sort of the the systems to change. So it's it's good. We should all be doing whatever we can to change our lifestyles. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jean. You're welcome. Uh, I know everybody collectively. <laughs> learned a little, this is just what we're into. And we're so happy to have the opportunity to have you here with us. And now living in North Bay. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I will chat to you about that, that fair. And... Um, Thanks, everybody. I'm going to uh, send you, I'll put those recordings up from this week in your email. Okay. So you can look at, you can, t you know what? Share them out to your families. And th these are, that is, uh, that, that uh, presentation is uh, really uh, layman terms and uh, easy to understand and I think could be a great influence on our community. So thank you again. I'm going to be walking from Memorial Drive on uh, either way. We'll make a decision when I see who's going to show up. Is anybody going today? I'm not going to go. Nobody's going? Okay. Okay. I guess Enjoy I'm not walk. either then. I'll walk my dogs. Okay, you can <laughs> join us at one, Harriet. I can't. I have a meeting on the resilience fair at one. <laughs> so. Anyways, chat with you later. Thanks. Jean, do I have your phone number? I don't think so, but I'll put it in the chat for you if you want. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay, for, for uh, you know, finding, finding uh, Jean, well, I know you already had found her, but for bringing her as a guest. and uh, right, It makes for some great conversations that we have. Oh, I bet. Uh, I, I, she hasn't yeah. even touched on some of her experiences in the Arctic, which is just fascinating. Well, uh, isn't that what we're going to do? Are we doing that in June? Yeah, yeah that's, that's going to be awesome. So that'll be a bit more casual. I'll just show you guys lots of pictures yeah. and talk about, yeah, like what, what it was like to be up there. Yeah. Well, while you're still here, and since I'm not going to be walking with the group this morning, um, uh, so that resilience fair is going what the whole concept is for us to um, uh, educate the community on what's happening and what they personally can do. Just exactly what you gave us today. Nice. And so it's going to be at the entrance of Canada or College. When they walk in, there will be computers set up. They can go and do their a very short ecological footprint. And then as they go down, they're going to find out the uh, the they're going to find out why they they should be thinking about this, then how, and then, uh, uh, or what they can do about it. And then they, we want them to leave with one, at least one action. 
that right. they can yeah, uh, implement within their own environment, you know? So uh, we're really excited about it. And we're going to have 20 minute sessions uh, uh, throughout the day. The afternoon is going to be geared to family and children. It's a wonderful, it's, it's very exciting. Right. And uh, we're going to have a, the municipality institutions, and then we're going to have a business, uh, Earth and NS businesses that are committed to working towards sustainable practices. And they're going to be there and they're going to have to, to uh, tell their uh, potential clients why they are, are what they're doing, you know. Nice. And we plan to have the uh, good life goal emojis up so that people will know here's some of the things they're they are considering you know, as relative to their business. Oh, you know? awesome. Yeah. It sounds it sounds awesome. It sounds great. I'm really yeah, we're hoping that it will be an annual affair. And we're starting at Canada and then maybe moving to one of the bigger locations if we get a good response. Nice. So let's see how that goes. Anyways, thank well, you. So the only I, thing, so uh, I'm I'm back from I'm back from my Arctic trip uh probably on the 19th. Okay. Um, and then, so uh, I'll have to, so my, my dad and I were planning on going hiking, um, in Lake Superior, maybe at the end of the month. So okay. I'll, uh, I'll double check with him the dates, but anyways, you and I can be in touch. Um, yeah. Okay. I'll That'll see, be uh, cause we might be able to go in October, but, um, I'll just check in with him. Yeah, of course. Of course. I understand. Well, yeah. that, I'd love to worst, case, case, though. worst case scenario, we could do, a a video, you know, oh, if yeah, necessary. True. But I'd really love to have you in person since you're you're going to be a resident of our community, you know. Yeah, well, I'd love to. It'd be nice to um to meet others who are interested in this type of stuff in the community. Yeah. So I, would, I would really like to be there in person as well. We, yeah. We, we have somebody. Her name is Kylie Grupe. I don't Kylie Ann Grupe. I don't know if you know her yet. You will. She is a community engagement specialist for, um, oh shoot, Dufferin County. Okay, nice. And uh, they're really into sustainability. And uh, she's work. she also volunteers for Green Economy North. And uh, uh, there's, yeah, there's lots of people, even oh. within this community, you're going to, you're going to meet and you'll be surprised, I think. But we're so happy you're here. Believe nice. me. Thank you again. I'm happy and, to be here too. Okay. All right. Bye, everybody. Have a great weekend. You too. Can't stop recording.